Well, thank you everyone for coming to learn about the California grid, which is a humongous topic. And I did not know how I was going to, I mean, first I had imposter syndrome and then I, um, because I'm not an expert, I'm not an electrical engineer. I've never worked in the um, electricity sector, but, and then, then I had a panic attack because this is such a gigantic topic that like no one person can know it all. And then I thought, okay, well, I'm just gonna tell you what I know and put it in the context of what we do as a league and what we what I know as a weather and climate specialist in terms of where we need to go and the challenges that we face. Um, and then we'll take questions. We have a lot of experts here. Yeah, uh, many of you who are electrical engineers who can, uh, so maybe together we'll learn and we will answer some questions. I'm now going to share my screen. I could not figure out presenter view and still see my notes. So you're, you're going to see my notes. And um, so first off, one of the, uh, if you look at the League of Women Voters, we actually have a lot of policy positions about provisioning the basic needs of everyone. And not only is it league policy that we leave no one behind, but it's also US policy um, that like since we, did, we passed a rural electrification act, we decided that we were gonna hook up the whole country to electricity. Now we didn't quite do it, but we tried to. Um, at least for white people, um, we got electricity access to most parts of the um, country where white people lived. And the, and what we want to do is moving forward to like not replicate the mistakes of the past and take the good things that we did in the past and modernize it for a low carbon future while leaving no one behind. And, you know, what is a grid? I used to work for a guy um, who was the head of a global grid computing consortium. And the whole idea of a grid is that it's plug and play. Like you can go anywhere, you can go anywhere in the world and, and if and you, you plug into the grid, you will get electricity that, and you will be able to run your equipment. As, and this is how, um, this is how it, the general idea, how it used to work where there would be some sort of a power plant and then it would be, um, you would use some transformers so that you can move it at high voltage, long distances, or um, and then do a step down perf uh, transformer to your neighborhood and then have another transformer like before it goes into your house. And so th this is like, this is a vertical, this is what's called a vertical model and in the past, in the past, we didn't have a vertical model. Like houses had electricity, like very wealthy people had electricity and they had the power plant at their house or somewhere on their property. Or if you weren't wealthy enough to have a big property at, to run a power plant, which was usually run by coal and it was really smelly, or maybe you were, uh, or maybe you lived at a mill house, and you lived at the bottom of a place where it flooded a lot. But at least you could turn a mill wheel and generate electricity that way. But you had to live somewhere where electricity was available. And if you couldn't, you might move into a city or in a, what they used to call mansion flats, where there could be electricity plant in the basement of like the, the fan, you know the fancy apartment um, houses in New York City. They, they're like over a century old and they were built and pe rich people lived in apartments because they got electricity in them. And we're now moving, uh, and then then cities got into, you know, then cities be began to offer municipal power and that, and people moved to the cities so that they could have municipal electricity and water. And, but then like rural people got left behind. And so one of, one of the things that we did, both in um, in terms of making lives better for people, is to and it, in terms of making work for people that needed work during the um, depression, was to uh, bring elect 
to try to bring electricity to the whole country. And then this took several decades. Now, this talk is heavily influenced by a book that was published this year and I just read recently, and it's called How Infrastructure Works. Um, professor Sh Shashra is a, a professor at Olin, and she talks about the philosophy and the ethics of engineering, as well as the physical infrastructure, as well as the physical system. So if you're like infrastructure is like a physical system, like the map I just showed you. But ultrastructure or, um, or superstructure is like the social and legal and ethical framework that we operate the physical systems under. Like that, that we want to make electricity ubiquitous so everyone has access to it. We want it to be reliable. So like you're not left without heat you're not left without light. You're not left without um, life-saving medical equipment. Like it will be there for you. That is our promise. And then the third leg is affordability. And that's where we fail a lot. Um, that's where California is failing the most. And so going back, early grids were private. And then people banded together into uh, like municipal or cooperative, rural cooperatives, ran their own, usually coal or oil power plant. And then they shared the electricity in a rural cooperative. Uh, but they were, you know, th they started out private. Some of them went like a public shared model. Some of it went into a private shared model. And then, um, but it, we cooked up the whole country and the whole country can share electricity. Um, not perfectly, but we can, if one part of the country is experiencing something extreme, the rest of the country is able to send power to them. This is like, this is the way that we help each other. This is our social, this is our social um, promise to one another. But then like, for, for decarbonization, we're doing rooftop solar, which um, is the tail that wags the dog if you like read a lot of newspaper stories, because it we're privatizing electricity again. And so there's both a um there's both a social tension with that, as well as how are we gonna fund it? And we'll talk, you know, we could talk about it like all night long if we had enough time, but I want to get through other stuff first. And like in the early days when electricity was local, you could just run a direct current. You, you know, you just, you get your electricity through direct current. But if you wanted to uh, send it over long distances, the, um, your volts, your loss, your power loss was inversely related to your voltage. So um, in, you, you want to like, if you're going to send your electricity over longer distances, you're gonna experience large losses unless you crank up the voltage, a very high voltage. And back a century or so ago, the, we, were, we knew how to crank up the voltage for AC. You just wrap wire around a solenoid and you could do the step up and step down transformer very easily. Um, and we have only in recent decades figured out how to do the same thing for DC. So when we built the US grid, uh, when we built grids worldwide, it's alternating current, uh, which means like when I was a kid, I used to play in a youth orchestra and we um, like, I played the violin because I have a Taiwanese mom. And of course I'm a good girl. I played a violin and I made concert master because I'm a good girl and I practice. But like the oboist would play an A note and then I would match the A and the rest of the section would match the A and the, and the vi second violins and the violas. And so when we are all matching the same pitch or harmonic of the same pitch, and this is what's happening with the global grid when we have alternating current, we're, we have to match the same phase and the same frequency as each other, or else you start dampening each other's waveforms and you lose, you dissipate energy. So to be efficient, you've got to be all in phase, same pitch, same phase. You're, you're a choir and, and it's like, 
if you want to get metaphysical about it, the whole country is singing the same, you know, singing together along. This is this is like a church choir, you know, where we're, we're um, this is what's really amazing when you come and you think about the grid and what it what we do for each other. But the problem with having AC is that the demand, you know, the supply and the demand have to be perfectly matched. If you don't, if if you um, add too much supply faster than people can consume off the grid, then the um, then the frequency goes up. And if you um, if you're using if you're using electricity more power than is being added to the grid at any one time, then the frequency slows down. Okay, uh, Kathy has a question. Kathy, you're muted. You're showing this graph and then you're talking about phases and frequency. And so does, does above the green line and below the green line? This so, is just so one period. Do you see this one sixtieth of a second? US, yes. US grid runs at 60 Hertz. So you want it to be at, um, one sixtieth of a second. That's one whole wave uh, fa uh, waveform, and like what happened in so what happened in Texas during the big freeze was that their their power supply went started going down because their um, a lot of their gas generators weren't they froze the the pipelines froze. Um, the um, the wind turbines froze. Mainly, it was the gas that failed. Um, but what happened is, if if people are using a lot of electricity to say to heat up their house, and there wasn't enough power being put on the grid, and the demand was greater, then then the frequency went like from 60, 60, This is where you want to be. And then it started going down, 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 down. And it got to like, it got to a very dire point where if the frequency is too uh, out of this tight band near 60 Hertz, you start breaking, you start breaking equipment that's connected to the grid, uh, which is a very expensive thing to do. And not only that, you, you could like, you could crash the whole grid and necessitate what's called a black start of the entire grid. So if you crash the whole grid and then you have to start it from scratch from like a cold or black start, it could take several weeks to several months to start a grid the size of Texas. And like, and, and that's something, this is something that is done in warfare, like in the Ukraine war, this is why the Russians bombed the largest power generators in, in Ukraine, and they took over Chernobyl, and they uh, they bombed the power lines, because if Ukraine's grid goes down, they can't restart it again in a wartime. And so, like over a period of several months, the EU quietly matched their frequency and phase. They 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 quietly matched Ukraine's frequency and phase to the Eastern European grid so that the so that Ukraine instead of being connected to the Russian grid became connected to the Eastern European grid and the other Baltic states the Baltic states helped uh, keep their grid stable so that they could so that they could resist and the, and so this is where like uh, it, this is ultra structure. Um, and like, who, like who governs all this, right? Like how, this is the world's biggest machine. And like, how does this all work? How did we make these agreements? And, you know, never mind the, the technical stuff, which is hard enough, but how did we do the political stuff? So we all get along and we're able to help each other. And um, I mean, we have the Department of Energy, but like in terms of operations, that it it's actually a, a organization, a nonprofit organization made up of um, of like power providers. That the Nash uh, is it Nor um, 
what is it called? The North American Electric Reliability Corporation. Um, and so they, they run, they set the rules and they also recognize, they, they recognize like subgrid operators. Like we're in the, we're in WEC, which is the Western Electric, I can't even remember, but um, M uh, is the, um, the Midwest. This is, uh, this is Texas and um, Southeast. Um, and then you also have the, um, the Northern states, but, and then even, and then within the regions, there are sub regions. And, but most of the, uh, like most of the country belongs to what is called the Western, like the green part is the Western interconnection. And then the, um, East of the Rockies is the Eastern interconnection. So like the, the West and the East are not in phase with one another. And we do share, we do share electricity when um, in times of need, but we share it through DC connections, which is what I told you was a relatively new thing where we learned how to do high voltage DC. And with, with DC, you're able to pass electricity around without knowledge of each other's phase or, um, or frequency. And then Texas does not want to be under the control of, um, of NERC or FERC, the Federal um, Energy Regulatory Commission. Energy Regulatory Commission. So Texas doesn't want to be subject to federal law. So they make sure that their, their grid or co does not touch, uh, does not cross any um, city, uh, any state border. However, there are portions of Texas that are in um, other grids. And they also are able to share electricity with Mexico. So um, I read when I was asked to lead the energy team, I was worried because I don't have a background in electrical engineering, my PhD is in physics, but I read a whole bunch of books about the governance and the history of the grid and how it how it works, who does what. Um, we'll look at, uh, this is just to give you an idea that you don't have to read electrical engineering to understand why we do the things we do. It's helpful, but it's not necessary. A lot of these people that I think are experts, like Gretchen Bakke's book, The Grid, she's an anthropologist and she went and she studied the people who run the electricity grid. She, you know, she shadowed people in industry and in government and, and anthropology is actually a good way of observing and then ask and trying to figure out why people do the things that they do. Anyway, uh, highly, highly recommend all these books. And, there, and I, even though I read Dustin Mulvaney's two books, Solar Power and Sustainable Energy Transitions, also highly, highly recommend. There are a lot of things that weren't explained in his books. And he was very, he, he's been very generous with his time. You, I emailed him my questions and he would answer them even with a newborn at home. He would answer my questions within a week by a, a very thoughtful email. And he he also has testified in Congress most recently, I think last week, he um, was testifying about the clean energy transition and um, about scare, the supply, supply chain issues and also about um, starting a circular economy of the, um, of the materials that are in um, the sustainable energy transition. So that we, because these are scarce things, we want to make sure they're scarce materials. We want to make sure that we build in a way so that we can recycle everything with the highest recovery rate possible. Otherwise, we're just going to be uh, using up a lot of energy to uh, using too much energy trying to do uh, the transition. 
And, oh, and I also read this wonderful um, definition about the, you know, the federal government exercises these powers through FERC, which then relegates some of its powers to regional transmission organizations, RTOs. And an ISO is just an RTO that is, that is only for one state. So if it's multi-state, it's called an RTO. If it's only one state, like it is for California, that is Cal ISO. But here's the thing. The states retain the powers of siting, construction, and permitting for regional energy infrastructure. The states do this. Now, Remember, do you remember Standing Rock? Uh, the, the federal government has the ability to build oil and gas. It has been granted the authority by Congress to build oil and gas pipelines, interstate oil and gas pipelines, and use eminent domain, regardless of what the um, landowner what or what the local jurisdiction wants. The federal government can do this only for oil and gas. The, the federal government cannot do this for transmission. And this is why we had like during the, um, hold on a sec. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your patience. Now, when you were, when we were hooking up like municipal municipal electricity companies, they are, are you know they they're able to build use their local eminent domain to build transmission, and during the rural you know rural electrification, people in the rural areas are highly incentivized to get on the grid, and so they would uh, so individual landowners were quite happy to allow transmission. We would and we would do it near the roads. So it was just taking a little bit extra land. You know, you're already running the road through. Let's run, let's string some transmission up next to the road. Well, now that we're doing distributed, um, now that now that we're doing much more distributed power generation with where we're where the wind power and the solar power are not in the cities where the consumers are. You're going to go through a lot more undeveloped places. And the federal government only has jurisdiction over federal land. And so they so they can build transmission through federal land. But that federal land is under federal control, often because it's very environmentally sensitive. You know, it's a watershed. It's, you know, it's a watershed. It's a very natural scenic place. It is very uh, sensitive, endangered uh, habitat for endangered species. You know, these are places where we want to tread lightly. So the way that we fund transmission is we have to figure, you know, we have to get someone to agree to let you site transmission. And then the person who is the last to hook up to it pays for that last mile. So, ev so you everyone wants to be as close to transmission that uh, that already exists as possible, so that they have to pay for building the fewest miles of transmission, and then this becomes attention because if the if the federal government will allow transmission through federal sensitive lands, then people want to put solar farms on desert tortoise habitat or endangered Joshua trees or all the things that I love and I don't want to be paved um, to be bulldozed for solar power. So like, so th this is like a, the central tension in the way that we, um, we pay for transmission it is very non-optimal. And if we have non, if we have bad laws and we get bad outcomes. And so, so Dustin Mulvaney has been a big proponent for rethinking how we pay for transmission and um, how we cite how we cite sustainable energy. And this is uh, and this is like there's whole chapters in his textbook, Sustainable Energy Transitions, talking about the trade-offs, because it's always about trade-offs. I and like, but we have the laws that we have. 
and we can make them better but only if we all come to the table and we're able to talk rationally and we're going to have to make compromises. This is not going to be easy, but it has to be done. And this is where I think the league could make a difference because we can, we can hold panels where people can disagree, but we can also find common ground. We, we need the public to understand how difficult this is. And um, like our local um, grid operator, like who controls our grid? And in California, it's Cal ISO. I don't know how to pronounce it, but I've always called it Cal ISO. And you can go to their, uh, their daily dashboard, um, iso.caliso.com. And you can see like, this afternoon, what our current demand is, what our forecasted peak is. And they have to do this planning seven days in advance. They look at what the weather's gonna be and they determine, you know, the expected contribution from the renewables based on the energy, the expected demand, uh, based on the weather. And then they come up with, um, then they make a plan on who's gonna be providing that electricity that we need for the upcoming day and the upcoming week. And, the, and they're like people, there are buyers and sellers on this market. They facilitate it all. They're, they're like a, a market place for people, buyers and sellers of power. And there is a lot of transmission. Uh, there's just a lot of transmission. You can uh, download this and you can blow it up and, and the, it's so incredibly dense in Southern California because we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of load here. You know, you and I plugging our computer in. That's we're pulling a lot. That we're load. Um, me running my heat pump. That's load. And so if we have a lot of people, we have a lot of distribution coming in. We have a lot of transmission coming in. Transmission is long distance wires, and then um, distribution is like your neighborhood sub um, your neighborhood substation, small grid scale. So, um, and then all these all these lines are owned by somebody. So, you know, they're sometimes they're owned by a rural co-op, sometimes an electric utility company like SCE, um, PG&E. Some of them are owned by the the federal government, and like this one. The Pacific Inner Tie is owned by five different entities, but mainly uh, LA Department of Water and Power. And um, th this one moves a lot of electric hydropower electricity from the Pacific Northwest to Southern California. We like in Southern California, we can't, we don't have enough water to produce hydropower. I mean, we, there's some, there's small, there's hydropower over by Hoover Dam, over by Boulder City here on the Colorado River, but that mainly serves the region around there. Because you, once you put, once you put power onto a grid, it's usually consumed, you know, it flows from high voltage, to low voltage, and voltage is really kind of a theoretical construct. It really, that it, think of it as kind of like the gravity for power. You know, it goes from high to low. And if, if there's a power plant near you pumping out, uh, putting power on the grid, then you're probably consuming the power from that power plant near you. But you're also, um, but Southern California, because of the horrible, horrible pollution that we had, you know, we're a very smoggy valley, we were given by, we were given by the feds uh, dispensation to import most of our electricity from outside the basin so that we don't, um, we're not burning, we're not burning so much oil and gas and um, adding more smog when we are already exceeding our EPA thresholds for air pollution. So our Southern California was designed to import both our water and our electricity. And, and that, does reek of colonialism. However, we are also very thrifty with that water and electricity. So um, when you're using something that is brought from outside, yes, you pay them, but then you're also, how should I say this? 
you're depending on their grace in terms of because they're suffering pollution to give you clean energy. And we owe them not just our money, we owe them our thanks. And so we do have a responsibility to them to, to not be wasteful with it. Um, then, so the um, Department of Energy also runs a wonderful website called the, uh, well, agents, a sub agency called the um, Energy Information Agency. And you can find all manner of things at EI, uh, EIA.gov, including this GIS, Geographic Information Systems layer, that shows you like all of the assets, all the energy infrastructure that like, so it's got, it's got like the, all the power plants, all the solar farms, all the utility scale things, all the power plants, the solar, the wind turbine, the wind farms. It also shows you the oil and gas pipelines and, um, I think it also has the transmission that is owned by the federal government, but it doesn't show like the ones that are owned by others. But you can see like over here, the little gray dots are wind turbines. And you can see over, you know, south in the, in the Great Plains, there is so much, there's so much abundant wind energy here at some times of the year and some nights that energy is just free. If only we could move it from here to the West Coast, we would have carbon-free, practically free energy just for the price of building that transmission. So even though building the transmission is really hard from a governance point of view and a permitting and the siting, it's, it's worthwhile because the payoff is we're gonna have, we're gonna have clean electricity after the sun sets and it won't depend on ch slave, slave children in Congo mining cobalt for us. Th this, you know, like, so it will be clean in both an ethical way and in a carbon way. Um, so this is like a very important thing, important thing for us to do. So the um, National Renewable Energies Lab in Golden, Colorado. They created a wind resource map of the United States. And this is just your annual average of the wind. Like I used to, um, I used to work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research as a weather and climate data specialist. And one of my, one of my job responsibilities was to help renewable energy, um, comp uh, renewable energy developers uh, look at publicly available data to find uh, areas of, of opportunity for them to cite more renewable energy uh, resources. And like you can see that California is not a great place for wind energy, except like at the like at ridge tops. But we are like offshore, we have really abundant wind resources offshore. And we also have, there are certain areas near mountain passes that are, that have like, we have these mountain valley circulations where during the day, the valley air warms up with the sun and it rises up slope. It runs a turbine. And then at night, the air cools and it runs down slope. The mountain valley circulation gives you kind of a reliable uh, reliable winds that can help you with late afternoon when everyone's running their air conditioning can help you with the evening when everybody's running their induction stoves. So it, it's not enough, but it, it it's a big help. And the during the great the Great Plains are incredibly windy, incredibly windy in, during the winters, which is good because during the winters the nights are long and we do not have um, we don't have solar for as many hours of the day. So we could use that wind from the Great Plains if only we had like a DC intertie that would bring it westward to us. And um, over by New Mexico, if you look over here by New Mexico, there are a bunch of wind turbines just to, there are a bunch of wind turbines just to the east of um, Albuquerque. And that's being brought LADWP and I think 
um, some of the um, private companies are also contracting to buy some of that electricity because it can uh, come via existing line. Now over here, um, it, over by Wyoming, uh, Utah border, um, Berkshire Hathaway, what's it, was it Pacific, something Pacific is, um, they're building a 350 mile long line from their wind farms to get it to the existing transmission. So one of the nice things about the New Mexico uh, wind farms is there's, this, there's a circulation, it's called the um, Southern Plains Lower Level Jet. And, and it runs off of the heat gradient between the Gulf of Mexico and the Gulf States. So like every night during the summer, wind comes up from the Gulf landward and it gets as far as New Mexico. And so that means that summer evenings, we're, we'll be able to pull electricity reliably summer evenings from New Mexico. And like wind, summer days in the plains are kind of unpredictable. It, if, you have, if you have hazardous weather, if you're expecting hazardous weather, like tornadoes and stuff, the wind is just too turbulent. You can't run the turbines if the wind is too turbulent or it's too high. So having a slow or medium, having a medium and predictable wind on a predictable schedule is like gold. And so this is what the New Mexico wind farms are gonna buy us. This is what the offshore uh, wind, we recently just auctioned off the offshore wind leases um, off of Central California. And the bidding was kind of subdued, but enough people bid, they sold all of them. 750 million, I think, was uh, they generated that much in the leases. We'll see if they actually get built. There are a lot of impediments for offshore um, wind development. And we'll talk about that later. But they're um, big, big speed bumps. One, it, you can see like the continental shelf just drops off very steeply off the California coast. Um, this is, I mean, the Pacific plate is underrunning the North American plate and that's why we have cliffs and that's also why we have such a um, sharp drop off. And the deep water just makes it very expensive to anchor it in place. I mean. I think some of these things they're planning on floating them because they're not going to be able to anchor them to the sea floor like they can in other parts of the world. And um, you also have to worry about endangered species. You know, you, you want to, it's easier to develop wind where you have roads. Well, we have roads where the mountain passes are, right? The mountain passes are like, they're easy for us to go through the mountains, but they're also easy for the birds to, you know, birds migrate through those mountain passes. So we're gonna have to shut down the turbines when it's bird migration season. Well, what if that's also like the home hunting grounds for an endangered species, like a golden eagle? Well, you there is no, there is no allowable death rate for endangered species. So a place can be like great for wind turbine development and completely inappropriate for wind development because of the wildlife there. And that's another tension that we have to balance. We have like dark money opposition. Recently, there are a lot of exposés about how all the people that are worried about turbines killing right whales, well, it turned out that was a fossil fuel coctopolis um, dark money, um, astroturf thing uh, and like we also have like nimbyism like there are people who say that a turbine is just not very attractive they don't want to see it from their house from their beach house they don't want to see a wind turbine well i think that's an aesthetic preference is it um i think a wind turbine is beautiful but people who own very expensive beachfront houses uh, politicians listen to them more and they said they don't want to see wind turbines so that so then the politicians say fine well the wind turbines will be 
out of view from the coast. So they'll be farther from the from the land. But if the farther the land is, then the deeper the water is and the more expensive it will be to develop it. So we really have to change the political, you know, change the narrative about wind turbines being ugly and something to be hidden because that just drives up costs and complexity. And then like, and then if you delay and delay and delay and the interest rates went up above 8%, you know, they used to be 4%. Well, this makes it like, much more expensive to develop. We also had supply chain issues with getting the parts. You know, the IRA money helps, but it, you know, but there's a, but you have to buy American. Well, do we have a turbine? Do we have a wind turbine um, industry within the US? Well, not yet, but we're, we're gonna get there. Because when I was, I, I rode my bicycle through Portugal and it, and, and, um, Another year, I rode it through Sicily, and they both had wind turbines everywhere. And Sicily and Portugal just, Sicily is still poor, and Portugal was poor 20 years ago. But they are now able to produce their own wind turbines. So we, and we, they were able to develop a wind turbine industry, and we will too. I'm sure that we can catch up. But we do have a problem with the Jones Act. You know, the 1920 Jones Act said that you cannot bring you cannot bring goods from one U.S. node to another U.S. node unless it's a U.S. made ship with a U.S. crew. Well, no ship that is capable of carrying humongous wind turbines is made in the U.S. There is no Jones Act compliant ship in the United States that is capable of moving wind turbine components. So like we have wind turbines in the Northeast because they're close enough to Canada that they can like bring stuff in from Nova Scotia. But in the California coast, we don't have this. So we're, so we're either gonna have to make an exception in the Jones Act, which is proven very problematic, or we're going to have to start building our own ships. Now, there is one company that is trying to build a Jones Act compliant ship, but it will be operating in the Northeast US. We need to do something about the West Coast or we're gonna be left behind. You know, we don't have that many, we don't have that much in our carbon budget left. And this is, this is something that keeps me up at night. Now this, now, solar um, NREL also has a similar map for solar irradiance. This is uh, this is not just um, based on your latitude and your orientation to the sun, but it's also based on cloud cover in your area. And so that so that's why you know, wind resources are so good the farther south you go, and also in the southwest deserts. Now you'll notice that like solar irradiance is not that great near the coast where it's it's cloudier a lot, especially like right on the coast. We have June gloom. And I, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area and summer is when we brought out our down jackets. But believe it or not, like rooftop solar took off in the in the areas with the worst solar irradiance, just because that's where the money was. And um, so that was interesting. Now, one of the things about I people, Detractors say, well, the wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. And yeah, well, duh, we know this. But we also know because we have kept excellent records about, um, they're, they're called wind roses, which is like the climatology of wind in various areas. And pe people with um, at renewable energy development companies would come and they would get this public data and they would run Monte Carlo simulations to figure out where they could, where they should site their wind turbines and where they should site their, um, their solar farms so that they could make their money back. And like right here, like Hurricane Hillary. So you hear people say, oh, Hurricane Hillary, it did such a, n a number on our solar, um, 
Oh, by the way, what are we looking at? This is starting from the bottom. This is our nuclear. This this is a flat line. We only have one nuclear power plant working now, Diablo Valley. Um, then we also have geothermal over the Imperial Valley. And in San Diego, we have a lot of um, geothermal, then biomass, um, biogas. That would be our, like our sewage gas and our landfill gas, large hydro, small hydro, natural gas. That's this big stripe here um then we would have the wind that's another uh lighter blue here and um batteries and the yellow would be the solar and you see that the solar practically disappeared during her uh hurricane hillary but it was it was a non-issue because we know when a we knew hillary was coming 10 days in advance and we prepared for it we knew that we were going to have to, we thought we were going to have to burn more gas, but it turned out we didn't because we didn't need as much, when there's a lot of cloud cover, we didn't need as, as much air conditioning. So the load was less. So you didn't actually have, need extra fuel, but in for other hurricanes, you know, you could prepare and you could stage the fuel like next to the power plant so that you're prepared for having less sun solar than you normally have and then we also like we also purchased um a day ahead or several days ahead uh electricity from neighboring states and that would be the pink our imports so we're pretty good we're pretty good at um at calculating at I used to do numerical weather prediction when I were, worked for Air Force Weather. Actually, um, I actually used to work for the Defense Meteorological Satellite Program. That, that's the source of this imagery right here. But so we're pretty good at predicting when the sun's not going to shine. We know when sunset is. We know when it's going to be cloudy. You know, maybe not at your house, but over a broad area. We know when it's going to be cloudy, and we can plan for it. So intermittent resources are not like they're intermittent and that's okay because they're intermittent in a predictable sort of way. We're good enough at prediction now that we can do this. What we're not good enough at is um, preparing for disasters. Like, th like things break down in a correlated way and we're good at correlating uh, cloud cover. We're not good at correlating when a gas pipeline is going to freeze and another gas pipeline is going to freeze. Now, like we know this, but we don't prepare. But we're like we're now learning that we have to prepare after the Texas debacle. And this also happened in the Northeast, where they had a terrible power outage and hundreds of people died. Um, hundreds of people died in the Urco outage too. Like this is like even. Even when we're having like a horrible heat wave and power, we have a brownout and people go without power for a few hours, people are still going to die because they get overheated or people will die because they freeze to death. You know, we have to, we have a social contract with one another not to let that happen. And, and so when it comes to like weather, when it comes to, electricity it's all about location 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 because it doesn't matter if free wind energy is available in north dakota i'm in la and it can't get here you know there's there's like this line that very little energy can cross and this is why there's like this huge energy differential and and this is also an opportunity for energy companies to build dc intertides because there's going to be a lot of money to be made doing this. It's it's good for decarbonization and it's good for capitalism. It's a win-win. You know, like I think there are very few things that like are just a win-win. Uh, we have to be careful about where we cite the transmission, but we have to be careful about where we cite anything. And there's this thing called the merit order which I learned from Brian Bartholomew, who works for a company that figures out where, where to cite batteries so that they can, one, they can make money and two, they can help the sustainable energy 
where they can help the sustainable energy um, transition. And, you know, every day, th th there are RTO critics, and this is a valid criticism, that people bid a day ahead to say, I can make you X amount of electricity at Y price. And they they take the market basket so they figure out how, they figure out what the demand is going to be for the next day and they look at all the bidders for the next day and then they set a market price and they say okay everybody to the left you're selling electricity tomorrow everyone to the right thank you for bidding but no thanks but instead of paying people the the price that they that they bid at they're all paid the market price, which is the highest price that cleared. So even if like wind is like practically free, like the market price that day for, this is one day that was um, pretty, where the price is pretty high because this is when the gas, natural gas prices were pretty high. Um, so the market clearing price was like 375. So people made a lot of money clearing that. <laughs> And this, so this white area is where you and I, as a retail consumers, we overpaid. This is what the RTA, this is what the RTO um, critics say, that we're overpaying for electricity. And I am very sympathetic to this argument. Um, like there, there may be people who would bid and take the lower price. In fact, that's what a lot of these longer term purchase uh, power power purchase agreements are. Um, and like Josh was here and he, uh, for SEE, they do that. Um, but so there, there are like the longer term, like where it's guaranteed for several years, they might be, they might still be paid like $30 or $40 here. But like the, the shorter term day had contracts were really overpaying. And that's one reason why in recent, in the RTO era, we're paying higher retail electricity prices. And the other one, um, is that the energy transition, it takes a lot of money to transition, right? You're paying for the old and the new. But CALSO, like not only are they the clearinghouse for the buyers and sellers of electricity, but they they also like collect data and they, um, and they're, and they present data for all the players and also um, accountability to, for us to do our, um, our accounting for our CO2, for our CO2 emissions for the day, right? Because we have state state laws say how much we have to reduce our CO2 emissions from each sector. And like one of the things is like over here, you see like they, they decide like what the demand is, but they don't, and this line, you know, there, there are parts where this line can be very steep where it could cost a lot to add that extra megawatt. Um, and you may not, if you do this thing called demand response, where if people knew, like I pay the same electricity rates, well, time of uh, every day between five and 8 p.m., regardless of what that day's auction was. And so that means I'm insulated from the market price that day. And so I don't have incentive to shave the peak to try to avoid that steep part of the curve. But if we had demand response, we could shave that, you know, we could all save money, but we'd have to collectively work together. And that's a very difficult thing to do to like say, for the good of the grid, please use less electricity. But what we did do one time last summer was um, it, September 6, 2020, 2022, we all got this text message saying turn you know we might lose you know that we we might crash the grid unless we all like turn off unessential electricity use and like in five or six minutes we shed 
2000 megawatts in five or six minutes. And we saved the grid. We did not have rolling black blackouts. We did not have brownouts. We didn't lose any um, expensive equipment. We all worked together to save the grid that night. Now, this went on, do you remember this heat weight went on night after night and it was like it was wearing, you know, just to be scolded to use last when it was just hot in the house. Our houses were just getting hotter and hotter, building up heat by the day. So you can't always count on people to do what for the greater good, except in very unusual circumstances, because there, there's a fatigue and even I felt it. Um, and I think <laughs> usually I'm okay about um, sacrifice for the greater good, but I was getting tired of it. I was thinking, why can't we plan better? And actually we can plan better. It's this thing called demand response where you pay people to use less electricity. Instead of counting on them to act for the greater good out of the goodness of their heart, you pay them. And in Oklahoma, 20% of the customers are on demand response programs. In SCE, I think only one or two percent are. And like I signed up for it where I get like 10 or 20 dollars every time I let them shut off my heat pump. But this like demand response is definitely underutilized in California. And we're going to be hearing a lot more about it because it is a really good way to reduce costs. And like so. Kaizo also does CO2 reporting. And you can see, like, people often ask, you know, like, I'm a renter. I don't, you know, so I can't put solar panels on my roof. What do I do if I want to reduce carbon um, emissions? And I, and I tell you, run your major appliances between mid-morning and mid-afternoon, because that is when the California grid it is, like, it's producing the least CO2 per kilowatt hour or megawatt hour that you're using. So this is when the carbon intensity of the grid is lowest, midday when the sun is high. So go at it. Um, I have a friend in Colorado who only plugs in their electric car on windy nights because there's so much coal on the Colorado grid but windy nights, all the coal gets shut down because the wind power is free. So um, CO2 per resource trend, Kaiso does this, and you can see that it actually, like, like this is our, in, so it's calculated for in-state generation and it imported energy. And do you see how it goes negative a little bit in the early morning? That's when we're exporting, that's when we're exporting um, clean energy, solar energy to neighboring states. And like we're importing, we're importing a little bit of coal, not a whole lot. We're importing natural gas power, we're importing nuclear power, hydropower. And interestingly enough, we're also importing the sun. Like when you look over here, you see all the solar power plants that are in Arizona? Well, they during the morning when the sun is bright there and we're waking up and we're making coffee, they're shipping this, they're shipping the sun, their solar energy out west to us. And um, and that's shaving the uh, that's shaving the need for um, and that's shaving the need for burning gas as well. Like and then during if we we if we keep developing solar energy um, like utility scale solar we'll be able to push it back to Arizona in the evenings when they need it and there's something that is very important I want to show like people really really love their rooftop solar systems and 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 that's good you should love your home. But you'll see that the California coast is diagonal, and the solar farms that are um, the solar farms that are developing all along the Central Valley, where they're retiring their farmland because they don't have enough um, they don't have enough water to farm as many acres. They're just retiring it and turning it into solar farms, and that 
and the, it's quite far west. Uh, it's quite far west of us. And so those solar farms, the sun sets in the Central Valley up here 45 minutes after the sun sets in LA. So it's helping us get over that evening demand, the, the head of the duck curve. Um, this is why utility scale solar in the Central Valley is so important because they are west of us and the sun sets later there. Not only that, when you have the um, utility scale solar, you can mount it on what's called um, sun trackers, sun tracking racks. So that like if you do roof, rooftop solar panels, it's just like, it's just aligned with your roof. But if you're doing it, uh, um, if you're doing it out on the ground and a utility scale, some you can do it so that it um, it follows the sun in its daily course, and then uh, summer and winter it tilts to to so it it tilts with the latitude of the sun, and it also tilts with the uh, um, the east west progression of the sun every day, and that means and that's why solar farms for the same panel because they're tracking the sun, they're able to get like three, like two, three, sometimes four times as much electricity production out of one panel because the solar farms are able to do that and our rooftop panels aren't. And if you look at how much it costs, how much energy and CO2 emissions it costs to build um, solar panels, you know, you wanna squeeze as much electricity out of um, the, the panels as you can because they're so energy intensive. So, th so this is why, like, we're always going to need utility scale solar because so that you can borrow the sun from other places and that they're just much more efficient. So um, here we are, grid shaving, CO2 reporting. Um, that, so our historical CO2 trend, you see that on, on average, like, this is 2014, uh, wait, this is 2014, and then 2015, and each year it seemed like it was monotonically decreasing. As we were adding more solar resources, the, um, the CO2 intensity of our grid was going down, but then it started to go back up. Well, what changed? We had a drought, and if you don't have if you don't have water, then you can't make hydropower and you're going to burn more gas. This is what happened during the um, dry years, 2012, 2016. And then, uh, oh, this should be 2022, uh, 2022, um, the water year. But then we had a very wet winter, 2022 to 2023 is a very wet winter. And here's where we're at. So this is See how um, in, we had so much snow melt and see how much snow melt we had in July. It, even in August, we were doing pretty good. Um, but we can't control El Nino, La Nina, um, the, the, the North, um, North American oscillation. You know, we can't control that, but we, do, we can control how we react to it. And one of the things about El Nino years is that um, like northern, the extreme northern, northern California might get more rain and it's pretty marginal what happens in southern California. But um, during La Nina years, the Pacific Northwest gets a lot of rain. And then so if we can ship the electricity north, south, back and forth, we can help each other. We can help support each other. And this is the famous California duck curve where this is our net load. This is our net load um, after uh, less renewables. And you can see that, so we, you know, we burn, we burn fossil fuel resources or nuclear during the night. And then, um, we, we need a lot less of it during the day as the sun, you know, as we are producing solar power. And then, but the evening, we have a very, very steep ramp. Uh, this is typical that we have to ramp up 
13,000 megawatt hours or 13 gigawatt hour, um, gigawatts in just three hours. And when um, gas turbines are basically like big, they're big ICE engines. And the smog, the smog that your car forms is largely formed when you're accelerating. And these gas turbines, when you're ramping up, you're accelerating. So there's a limit to how much you accelerate and you can still pass the smog rules because it's the combustion is less, the combustion is a lot dirtier when you're ramping up. And, and so this is a real problem. I mean, it's a surmountable problem, but this is a, a this is not people who are, this is not people who are, um, this is not like a fossil fuel um, propaganda. This is just the way that combustion works. So this is a technical issue. This is a pollution issue. We're hitting the limits of like um, smog and ozone production. So we have to be very careful about this ramping up, which is um, partly the reason why there is a lot more gas being burned. And um, so th this is, uh, I'll, give it, I'll give out the slides later so you can go, uh, this is a very interesting post from Cal, Cal ISO about um, our evolving load, you know, what it's like at night and di different seasons. Each color represents a different season. And you see that our highest load is in the summer and in the because of the air conditioning. And then in the Northeast, the highest load is in the winter because they're doing the, because of the heating. But so there are different patterns throughout the um, different parts of the country. And it wouldn't it be nice if we had a national grid? Wouldn't it have been nice if uh, like, well, Al Gore was talking about a national smart grid in 2000 because he ran on this because he was already thinking about this back in the 1990s, but that did not happen. He did not win and that did not happen. And this is where we're at, um, where it got as the sinking belly, the belly of the dock keeps getting deeper and deeper. Um, and so we have steeper and steeper ramps. And this is um, curtailment is when there's so much solar being produced, um, there's so much solar being produced and no customers for it, they actually have to shut down, they have to shut down the solar that's, or, or they have to shut down the wind turbine and that's called curtailment. And we track how much curtailment there is um, every every day and every month we track that and curtailment by itself is not particularly bad because the um the department of energy was looking at what the lowest cost grid for california or for the western u.s was and they deter because batteries are very expensive that um over Overdeveloping midday solar is not bad. You know, you could overdevelop it by 25%, like and have like 25% curtailment at midday and still have keep the costs for the um for the overall grid lower than if you were to do it build a smaller um smaller amount of solar with more batteries because batteries are just so expensive and transmission takes so long to build. And this is another great graphic from Brian Bartholomew because he loves showing these graphs because this is when his company is making money. Because look, the um, people are giving away free power at midday. You know, we're turning off the wind turbines, we're turning off the solar farms and electricity is still negative. People are giving away the electricity. He's got to, fi he figures out where people are gonna um, give away electricity his company builds battery farms out in these areas and they charge on el free electricity during the day. And then when the prices are really high during the, uh, the, the head of the duck curve right here, this is when his company and other companies like his are, dump, uh, are selling the electricity. They're getting electricity for free and they're selling it 
for $25 a gigawatt. I mean, that's pretty good. Wait, $25 per megawatt, I think. I think, yeah, $25 per megawatt hour. So this is what he's, and look how fast the batteries have grown. Like every year we're doubling the amount of batteries that are on the California grid. So, so this dot curve thing is going to resolve itself, but we do have a supply chain issue with batteries and currently batteries have some safety issues. You may not want to have them in your um, large batteries around your home in case of a fire. So um, I, I'm much more comfortable having the battery farms off site somewhere where they have fire suppression and sprinklers and, and um they, and they're um they have like thick they they're protected by thick slabs of concrete lest something bad happens but um the, every battery that is discharging is not just making money for someone but it's giving us cleaner air and that's and so that's another win win and that and so another thing people ask is like, how are we going to complete the green, you know, the the green energy transition in time when we only have what four, six, you know, like years left of our carbon budget to to make one point five to hold climate change to one point five degrees Celsius, and this is where. It's really sad what we have, this is where the politics of California housing has really made things worse for ourselves. It's made things harder. We have, um, because the more desirable areas develop first, like the, the areas near the coast where the weather is milder, we developed that, but we developed it with single family home, reserving most of the land for single family homes. And then we, um, we will not permit uh, densification and urban infill. So that means that people seeking homes are moving to San Bernardino County um, and it is hotter there. And like, so this is during a heat wave, this is during a heat wave July of this, this summer. Uh, and we had very high electricity demand due to air conditioning use. And like on this day where there was a high pressure heat dome that was like went all the way to the coast, we had um, we had a peak usage of like uh, uh, 40 something, almost 50, 000, uh, 50 gigawatts. But and half of it was half of it was gas. Well, a few days later, we had. We had a cool coast and it and but, but the uh, inland inferno. So uh, so on July 29th, so on July 26th, it was hot everywhere, and we had 24,500 um, megawatts out of gas, and then three days later, when the inland was still hot, but the um, coast was cool. We only needed 19,100 megawatts of gas. So had we had we built more housing along the cool coast, we could have burned a lot less gas. But because we sent all the new housing growth to the inland hot areas that requires air conditioning just to stay alive, we made it harder for us we have to burn more gas because we wouldn't allow that apartment building next door to us. And then even if we do allow housing near the R infill housing in the already developed areas, you know, like it's not like people can just open the window and have a sea breeze because we protect single family neighborhoods from apartment buildings for some reason, I don't know what we're protecting residents from other residents. I don't know. But then we build then we build apartment complexes right next to the freeway. 
you know, you've all seen, if you're in LA and you're driving up the um, 110 freeway to downtown LA, you've seen the Orsini apartments right up against like where the 110 and the 101 meets. That's the Orsini apartments here. 1,000 something, over 1,000 apartments are here. And then the, the um, these are the Franti apartments. These are the Da Vinci apartments. There are thousands of apartments in each of these complexes right in the middle of a freeway interchange. It is hazardous to open your window. It is bad for your health. It is hazardous. You can, it causes strokes, heart attacks, um, dementia, you name it, exposure to um, the particulates from the cars and the tailpipe emissions and the smog. It's very bad. These people can never open their windows. They must run their air conditioning. So people say, you know, what can we do to hasten decarbonization? You got to combat nimbyism and the dark money misinformation. We have to accept if you live in an area that is has a mild climate, is near jobs, then you got to show up for all the city planning meetings and you got to say yes to new apartments. You got to say yes to infill in the most desirable, pleasantest parts of your city. And that means if that means that they're going to have an apartment building right next door to you, if you want to do something about climate change, you want to do something about um, having an affordable clean energy transition, then you have to say yes to those apartment buildings. Yeah. And like I said about the um, Rural Electrification Act, we helped white farmers access the grid, but we did not help, like, say, tribal lands. We never hooked up electricity to the, the Navajo Nation, even while or um, or like Cheyenne reservations, even while we were extracting oil, gas, coal, or uranium from tribal lands, we weren't giving them the benefit of what we were extracting from them. So, they, so tribal lands never got, the federal government never hooked them up to electricity. And so that's something that like going forward, we have to center the vulnerable. We have to walk the, um, you know, we have to walk the walk, not just talk. And, um, Proposition 218 says that you cannot charge more than uh, the cost to provision like government service, uh, like uh, utilities. And, and this makes it very hard to help low income people um, access sufficient electricity and water for their basic health needs. Um, universal basic income. Yeah can really help people pay for rent, utilities, food, transportation. Like if you don't want to have these Frankenstein things like, oh, there will be four different rate tiers and it'll be based on your income. By the way, the government wants to know what your income is. You know, we could just say that we're going to give you a lump sum to pay for necessities. Then we could charge everyone the same basic charges. But so this is this is about how we're going to make sure that everyone has what they need. Center the vulnerable. Um, infill housing, near jobs and milder climates. Build more regional transmission because this is how we're going to get the wind and the hydropower. We're going to move the renewable energy resources. We're going to move the sun where it needs to be. We need to make smarter use of demand response like other parts of the country have and other nations have. And then one thing is like people ask if we're going to if we are going to electrify transportation and we need to electrify transportation because we can't burn fossil fuels forever for much longer, then we cannot replace ICE cars, internal combustion engine cars with electric cars one for one. There aren't there aren't enough resources. There aren't enough batteries for us to do that. There isn't enough parking spots. So we, we need to, so EVs by themselves are like a last resort for the ones that you can't mode shift, for the trips that you can't mode shift. We're treating EVs as like one and done. Oh yeah, I just traded my car in for um, a Tesla Y and, and so like I'm doing my part. 
Um, you're not really, you're barely helping. Uh, driving less, driving smaller cars, dr um, getting around without cars, we're gonna need to do that. More, and then only after you've looked at how you're going to eliminate that driving trip, then you can say, okay, those are really hard to decarbonize. I'll use an e uh, EV for that. Um, the EVs that we really need, I, I know there was a big splashy news line about how two wheeled EVs have displaced four times as much carbon emissions as um, four wheeled EVs. And like, this is my favorite, this is a turn GSD ad. They're a company out of Taiwan. And I was astonished when I did the comparison that, um, an e-bike can carry 10 times its own weight in cargo, but a 5,000 pound Tesla Y can only carry 800 pounds or 20% of its own weight. So like that is astonishing that two of these turn GSD cargo bikes, these family bikes, just two of these bikes carry as much weight as a Tesla Y can. And instead of being $75,000, it's $15,000 for the two bikes or $7,000 for each. Um, and then for the same battery materials as making one Tesla Y, you can make 160 something, 170 cargo bikes like this. Um, you can park 10 e-bikes in one car parking stall. And in one car, in one 10 foot travel lane, you can move 10 times as many bikes as cars. So in the city, like in the city, this is the right size vehicle. Now, like we're not talking about like Montana, uh, like a ranch in Montana. We're talking about 90% of Californians are live in an urbanized area or no, 95% of Californians live in an urbanized area. We can use electric bikes. Half of my, since I bought an e-bike in 2017, half of my trips now are on an e-bike. And then electric trains. Now I went to a Metro open house and I found out not only are our trains all electric, they run on these catenary right here, but they, they can send, when they hit the brakes, they can send the power back to the grid. And that, cause I was asking, you know, how is it that your light rail goes, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up and down, you know, like, isn't that kind of, and I said, well, isn't that kind of energy intensive? And they said, no, because we do regenerative braking, you know, where the, where this, where the grid supports it, we can send the electricity back to the grid and it, where the grid hasn't been upgraded to be bi-directional yet, we carry small batteries with us. So it's kind of like I have a I have a hybrid car, and so when I hit the brakes, seventy percent of the um, the energy goes back to the battery. I mean, seventy percent if it round trip efficiency. So I accelerate with a battery, and I decelerate, and I put it back in the batteries. So this is what our electric trains are doing, and. San Francisco has been running electric trolley buses for over a century. They and the, this is a Stockton bus. I like the Stockton bus because we uh, every month my family, you know, we piled in the car, we drove to Stockton Street in San Francisco to get groceries at Chinatown. But and Stockton is very hilly. It, it, it even has a Stockton tunnel because it's so hilly. But these buses send electricity back to the grid. So a bus that's going uphill is pulling electricity from a bus that's going downhill. They have such a high density of buses in San Francisco that there, there's a balance between buses that are going uphill and downhill and they balance each other out. It's kind of like the electricity version of cable cars. And then here's some more EVs. This urban arrow, you know, you can carry three, four kids if they're small, if they're smaller kids, you can carry four smaller kids. And um, and yeah, the, so you can carry four kids and adult here. So which is about the same capacity as this um this lifted truck, but it's a lot less carbon intensive here if you're doing electric assist car, um cargo bike. This is electric assist uh, um, arm bike for wheelchair user. The, and this, 
And you see these are um, regular and electric e-bikes in a bike lane, and there's an electric wheelchair right here. These are these are these are the appropriate EVs for a city. So here's a further reading again. These are the books I found very helpful. There are some other books that I started and I didn't think that they were worth reading and I didn't add here, but I I read a lot about energy. And um, some so I another question I got asked was like, where can I get data? And EIA, that's the federal government, Energy Information Agency, Cal ISO does this reporting. Grid info is where I managed to get this, these very nice graphs. Grid info is actually a, a, a volunteer effort of people in the uh, renewable energy industry. They get together, they share data, they share code, and it's free. You can go, um, this is like a GitHub um, repository of uh, software and data, and you can make these, um, these charts very easily. And you can even send them a little money to thank them. And um, that, that's what I have for you. And I went really long, I'm sorry. Questions? Is anybody still there? Yeah. Okay, Eric has a question. Yeah. Um... Yeah, this was an excellent talk here. There were a lot of different aspects, uh, and uh, I think most of us, uh, certainly I, I didn't know all the different angles that you uh, looked at this problem with. Let me say that there is some good news and that the population of California is going down, and so this um, housing uh, problem actually isn't a problem. Uh, the uh, the the infill and all that uh, that all has has to be taken care of, but the population uh, that was a problem that was talked about a lot fifty years ago, but it it is not talked about at all now. Uh, but the but the population of the state is going down, and then uh, uh, the one thing that I always find very uh, uh, important uh, is rooftop solar cells because these solar cells are going to last 50 years or 100 years because some of us who've had them for half for for about for about 25 years haven't found much degradation at all and if they do last for 50 years well then the price per kilowatt hour is going to be about five cents a kilowatt hour and so it would be good if, if industrial buildings and houses and apartment houses all had solar cells, because then you wouldn't need the transmission lines. And so it doesn't need batteries. And uh, and uh, uh, the, that's good. To keep in mind. And so that uh, yes. Yeah, so anyway, those are my comments. Thank you for those comments, Eugenie. You have a question. Um, I was wondering what percentage of the grid is now supplied with renewable energy and what are the different kinds of renewable energy that are supplying the grid? Like, say, for example, in the South Bay here, I understand we have the clean power lines. Do you know how... People well, say, oh, it's all renewable, but is, it's it, not, is it true? Well, <laughs> it is on paper, but like if if you're on the clean uh, CPA, is it the Clean Power Alliance or something like that? If you're on CPA and you're on the 100% renewable, um, there's still no solar energy after dark. So you're buying, you're buying renewable energy credits from someone else, usually like SCE. Um, and that the electricity that you and I get, because we only live two blocks from each other, it's it, it this we have the same power sources, but the difference is in how the paper renewable energy credits are credited. 
And so CPA is buying renewable energy credits for um, green energy that is consumed somewhere else at a different oh. time. But but it's not it's not like it's not like all theoretical because if the Clean Power Alliance is helping to develop solar power that wouldn't have been developed otherwise by providing money to develop it, then um, then that's a win for that's a win for the um, the whole grid as a whole. And that's one of the things that Leia, uh, Leah Stokes in her um, book Short Circuiting Power. She's talking. She's a political scientist uh, studying regulatory capture in the energy markets, and. She says that there's so many there's so many ways that you can game the system, but the best thing for accountability is what's called a renewable portfolio standard, an RPS. And so California has an RPS that says we will hit X amount of renewable energy over a um, over an annual average. We will hit that at such and such year. And it was like, and we hit 35 um, pretty easily. We're, we're like, we're just under 40% now. And that's, and that's another thing that not everything counts as renewable energy. Um, let me go back here. So we large hydro is carbon free, but it doesn't count towards our renewable portfolio standard. Um, nuclear is carbon free and it also doesn't count as renewable. So like more than half of the energy that's consumed in California is carbon free, but it doesn't count but it, not all of it counts towards a renewable portfolio standard. Hmm. Does that make sense, Jeannie? Yes. Um, yes, it does. I, I mean, I, it's really interesting. I guess I thought that maybe if we were buying, like if we had the Clean Power Alliance, that we were getting an active amount of renewable energy. It made it sound like that. No, you're getting the same energy I am because we're on the same. So we we have the same well, I, neighborhood substation. You're getting the same electricity, but it's credited differently. Credit. I mean, I, I'm not saying I'm not sure about the. I know we live close to each other and we have the same source, but I thought that it was like 100 percent renewable. And you're saying it's not necessarily. 100%. No, but but you're but you're buying you're buying solar energy for someone else somewhere else in the country. Oh, okay. Well, that's an interesting. So, I guess I need to understand that. Okay. Yeah, that that's what paper credits are. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is, I think Paul asked, you know, why don't we run? Why don't we run our water system, like the um, the state water project? Why why don't we run that? Uh, why don't we optimize hydropower production? And th that is an important question because 10% um, of the metered, 10% of the metered or the measured um, electricity usage in California goes to um, move water around, like the state water project, the Central Valley. Um, what the Central Valley project, these these huge mega uh, water uh, conveyance projects, they're pumping water from the Delta South. So they're so hundreds of miles uphill. And then that last lift where you're going up to hat is it to Hatchapi Pass coming to Kathy, do I have that right? The 1000 something foot lift to get it into the LA basin. That's like the single largest electricity user in the state of California. So we do like, so we try to run the water. We, we try to run the water to help the grid and use it when the 
when the electricity is cheapest and the electricity is the greenest. But you can't always do that because there are times like, do you remember when we had the, um, we had the snow melt coming off of the Southern Sierras and it was in danger of flooding Corcoran and we were just trying to get as much, we were trying to move as much water off of the Kern River as possible. And so we were running the pumps 24 seven um, and so you couldn't wait until the electricity was cheap and the sun was up and you got uh, clean solar power. You had to you had to move that water now, right? You, that because the the snow melt was coming, you had to do something. And that so there are things that you can shift. There are things that you can time shift, and then there are things that you can't. And then why is it that when we're running um hyd when we're running hydropower when we're running hydropower, we don't like, we don't, um, we time it a little bit for the peak demand, but we don't do it absolute zero. And then so that we can run more of it during the evenings. And it's because of the, um, because a river exists for something besides humans. It, it um, do you remember when we had, we had two biologists, uh, river ecologists talk to us about how stress, how temperature stressed the um, fish are in the streams. Because if you divert so much water, then the water is shallower and the earth is warming. And it's just so hot. Like the um, when the river is so hot, the fish are gonna die and the salmon isn't gonna run and the, the um, Native Americans go hungry. Uh, that rely on salmon go hungry. You know, we rivers exist for more than just our convenience, and we have to balance the needs of the um, the whole ecology of a river. It's not all about me, unfortunately. As much as I want it to be all about me, it's not just what I want. I think I got through all the questions that people ask. Is are there any more by email or are there any more questions? I just want to comment that I appreciate the way you put together kind of the systems thinking about like for example the inland housing. I never you know never really thought about like how, how these dynamics affect each other. And I think well, that's very meaningful. But do, do you remember when we had invited SCE to talk to us and they, they were talking about what they have to do resource adequacy and then they did different scenarios and the worst case scenario for um, the most the most difficult to to make clean the most difficult to serve the most expensive, you know, their worst case scenario was if we keep shunting housing into the inland deserts where it's so hot because it's then then the demand is going to shoot sky high and we can't meet it and the, the metropolitan water planner he said the exact same thing their worst case scenario for water planning was if we keep making people go out in the arid desert where the water demands are higher housing is really a big issue here we're going to have to take we're going to have to take housing refugees um i my daughter had a friend that moved out to arizona for cheaper housing and she's back here living with her parents because um one you know it's difficult for people in minority groups to live in these red states extremely difficult and dangerous it was physically dangerous for them to be there. And also um, it was just really hot and unpleasant. So um, they're back here uh, living with their parents. So uh, it, like when you build infill housing, you may not have more people uh, because families are smaller and, and, and kids want to live somewhere separate from their parents. But now, like, we're, we all have kids in their 20s and 30s living with us. And this can't go on. Anyway, off soapbox. <laughs> 
Terry, I'm sure, has lots of um, comments about housing. Oh, and we lost Terry already. Um, Josh is here. He works for SCE. And did I get anything wrong? I know I no, you did a great job, you. Grace. Because <laughs> Josh can give this talk because he, he's been working um, for SCE for so long. Anyway, that's it. Are there any more questions? All right, then I'm going to stop. I'm going to um, stop recording. Great. Stop there, recording. Was, there was one in the chat about <clears throat> why do we turn off renewables? Why not gas? Gas clearly can ramp up and down at other hours. Oh. Um, I, I don't know if you wanted me to answer that. Or... Why don't you answer that? Yeah, so I'm assuming you're talking about what we call renewable curtailment when we order renewable generators to shut down. So <clears throat> Grace used an analogy earlier when talking about natural gas plants, which is the same one I use, which is your car, right? Mm -hmm. So think about it like when you go to a stoplight, if you look at the RPM gauge mm -hmm. on your car, there's a, there's a sort of a minimum number that it usually goes and it never goes any lower. Usually for most ICE vehicles, that's about 750 rotations per minute. If your engine goes below that, it'll shut off, right? It stalls. So natural gas plants work very much the same way, right? Like at the end of the day, they're both combustion engines. So there's a, a floor uh, at which you can ramp down a natural gas plant. And if you go below that, you have to shut it off completely. And for reliability reasons, we don't want to do that because most of the natural gas plants um, are uh, an older generation technology where they take about 24 to 72 hours to go through the shut shutoff procedure and another 24 to 72 hours to turn back on. So solar, you know, goes based on the day. So, you know, while we don't need all of that natural gas generation in the middle of the day, we do need it in the evening for that ramp, right? Remember the duck curve graph that was on one of the earlier slides? So because that time period where for the peak solar production is less than that, that shutdown period, we, we can't ramp those natural gas plants down low enough to absorb all the solar energy. So by, you know, order of operations, we have to turn off the solar because solar doesn't need to ramp, whereas the gas plants do, right? Because if we let those gas plants shut off, they're not going to be there in the afternoon when the solar disappears, and then we'll end up having power outages. Right. And we're going to need less spinning gas turbines as we grow our batteries. Correct. So th this is, yeah. and demand response can help with that. If we just keep, right now, the cur right now, the, um, the head of the dot keeps climbing, but if we, um, but with demand response and keeping people near the coast, we can shave um, batteries, we can do all these things to help shave that so that our um, gas use is lower. And it's also important to realize that just because the gas use in California is higher doesn't mean the gas use in the Western region is higher. In fact, like we're we're trading the lowest cost electricity between um, the between the states, and so the whole WEC, the whole WEC region has been getting cleaner and having more renewables. Like so, it sure it's nice to say that you're at fifty percent of California, but it makes more of a difference in the big picture if we're at 40% renewables over the whole WEC region, which we're going to, we, you know, we're getting there. All right. And so was that, was there anything else in the chat box? Oh my gosh. There's 16 things in the chat. Oh, oh and nuclear. Um, oh, yes. All right. That was do, 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 Pacific Core. Thank you. Okay. And that is that.